This is Lisa from Mobile Tech Review, and this is the MSI GT77 Titan HX. 13V. <laughs> it's the 2023 edition with Intel 13th generation CPUs inside and NVIDIA RTX 4000 level graphics. One of the first that we're going to be reviewing, and this is a high end model RTX 4090. In fact, Intel sent this to us, and it also has a high end Intel 13th gen HX processor inside, hence the HX in the name for the model. So, this should be one of the fastest gaming laptops of 2023, in part because of the chassis. There's lots of room for cooling and high wattage GPUs and all that sort of thing. The ASUS ROG Strix SCAR 18 should also compete and come pretty close to this. And who knows, maybe something from Alienware in the X series will as well. But there's a lot of hype around this GPU. There's a lot of expensiveness around this GPU and we're going to look at it now. So as you've no doubt or heard by now, you've seen if you've been shopping for a new gaming laptop with a RTX processor from this generation, uh, they're not cheap. I, you know, and yeah, I don't know, is NVIDIA being greedy? Maybe. I mean, the whole crypto buying up, mining every GPU on the planet, that's kind of come to an end now. So what's with these pricing? Particularly if you go with the RTX 4090, which replaces the 80 series GPUs as the top of the line, right before we max out it. it 3080 Ti for a mobile processor. And I think it's a little bit more granularity for NVIDIA there. I mean, we still have a 4050, a 4060, a 4070, a 4080, you know, you get the idea. But the jump to the 4090 is expensive. But don't give up hope when you hear about the pricing on this, because I've seen some laptops already listed for sale. They're coming to the market soon. Most of them are pre-order still. But with a Core i9, lower level Core i9, and an RTX 4080, and you're looking at prices around $2,500, $2,600 for some of those, and some, you know, good name brands, Alienware and so on. So it's not that desperate a situation, but because they're coming out with the 4080s and the 4090s first and showcasing a lot of the 4090 performance, and the 4090 is like $800 more premium over it, it can be frightening. Now, this is the most expensive, biggest honking laptop that MSI makes. So the prices run from $4,300 to $5,300. So, you know, I was saying, you know, and buy this or recarpet my entire house. That's a lot of money for a lot of people. But obviously, a lot of what we're going to look at here is trickle down, and we'll be reviewing some lower end models too to see how they perform. And we'll also be looking at the Intel processor, which you're going to be getting in a whole lot of different laptops, and there's no jacked up price premium for those. All right, we've got that out of the way. When I say this is big and honking, well, you know, I've, I've been using an MSI Raider 17-inch, and that's a pretty big laptop. This one weighs even more, 7.28 pounds, which is 3.3 kilograms. Uh, so that's, that's heavy, right? That's old school heavy. Not as thick as they used to be, though. I mean, I remember using Titans many years ago, and they were like two inch thick machines. This is not that. It doesn't look that much bigger than the Raider, but what it does have is the world's biggest booty. So they took a page off of the Alienware, which is hanging that big booty out the back there behind the hinge for the cooling, and this is the most extreme version I've seen. Now, it's very effective. This thing runs really cool and nice, but uh, that's where most of the size difference is versus the Raider. But the weight difference, yeah, it's there. But the worst thing is that while ours came with the good old-fashioned, remember these, 330-watt power brick, which is weird, because last year's Raider with a Core i9 and a 3080, not consuming any more power, voltage, anything like that, came with a more compact charge or the GAN kind of charger. So why they're doing that, I don't know. Because this one right here, you know, watch out for small children. If you have a Chihuahua, the Chihuahua will not win if you drop this. So finally, this year, where we've seen the last couple of generations of laptops, uh, well, not with Apple processors, but uh, creeping up in the power consumption and in the heat, but largely the power consumption, they were getting faster in terms of CPU and GPU, by just throwing more power at them, right? And particularly Intel, though AMD even was doing a bit of that power and thermal creep. So it's good to see this year, one of the things that's nice is that that's stopped. Yet performance is greatly improved. So finally, right? You know, So an Intel 12th generation Core i9 in a laptop was a very good performer. And we got 20% more performance here, sometimes more for the CPU we have Intel Core i9-13950HX. The shipping version will have a 980HX, 100 megahertz faster. Not much of a difference there, but anyway. Um, yeah, that's a lot of difference and consuming no more power than the previous generation. Nice. And the same thing goes for NVIDIA too, because I was a little afraid of that. Okay, so we're going to make the, the new series even faster by 
cranking up the power. Now, NVIDIA claimed in their press conference, they're saying, oh, it's like 300% more power efficient. Wrong, only under unnatural circumstances. And I wish they wouldn't do that. Intel learned their lesson. Don't make crazy claims. We because you're going to be proven wrong and nobody's going to believe anything you say, right? But still, this is about 30% more power efficient. So we're looking at the same 170 watt GPU here that we had in last generation in the Raider, for example, yet the performance improvement is about 30 to 40% better, not using DLSS3's frame insertion or frame interpolation, where basically it can make up in between frames to increase your frame rates, which actually works pretty well, unless you're a really competitive CSGO kind of player, you probably actually would like that feature. But good to see there that we're not using any more power, but we've got that kind of performance gain. Now, it's gonna cost you, <laughs> Uh, one thing I will say is when the 3000 series GPUs first came out, it was, they were very expensive too. Not as bad as now because of inflation and because of NVIDIA's greed and crypto and all that kind of thing, what happened there. But I'm sure the prices will come down. And we don't have the GPU shortages that plagued us for the last couple of years and put a real chill on the whole market. Anyway, performance here fantastic. This particular laptop, the cooling is top notch. The physical design of the outside looks the same as the last generation, but inside they made the heat pipes more elaborate even. So take a look at the insides here. That's a lot of copper going on, right? In fact, so much so, and with four fans, that they had to whack one of the M.2 SSD slots. This one has three instead of four, and it works, folks. It's good. And again, the performance much better than last gen without getting any hotter. That helps as well. So surface temperatures on this are fine. Even the bottom when gaming is not bad, though this is too big a laptop probably to put on your lap most of the time when you're gaming. So yay, and I expect to see this with the other gaming laptops that we review, even with smaller chassis like Razer, for example. The blade is pretty thin and it's metal and all that. We'll be reviewing all of them. So that's good news there. So CPU performance improvements for the 13th gen versus the 12th gen mobile processor. So about a 40% improvement at least in Geekbench 5 multi-core. And it's nice to see also that we're breaking the 2000 barrier for single core. Now I even compare this to a desktop core i9. We have the 13900K desktop in the Intel NUC 13 Extreme. And it, in Geekbench, the numbers are very similar. In Cinebench, the desktop one still scores more. But you're getting the idea here that this is approaching desktop level performance. When it comes to the GPU, just talking about benchmarks, not games yet, uh, the performance is a solid 30%, if not more. So in terms of comparing it to last generation of mobile, that is with a 3080 Ti 16 gigabyte, right? So it, yeah, then I thought, okay, I'm gonna compare it to that NUC 13 Extreme, which has a desktop 3080 Ti GPU inside. And it was neck and neck with the 3080 Ti desktop, and in some cases, even better. So if you're wondering what the performance is like, it's great. It's not gonna beat a desktop 4090, obviously, but I, there's just about no compromise here. So that's all nice. What else about this laptop, though, before we get into some more nitty-gritty performance stuff? Cherry MX keyboard per key RGB. Oh, joy. Love it. Feels very good. Mechanical keyboard, what's not to like other than a little bit of clingy, clangy, clangy mechanical keyboard sound, but it's not that bad. Nice, very nice, and something for a high-end laptop I would like to see, and I was surprised that the Asus SCAR 18 doesn't have a mechanical keyboard on it. Alienware, of course, offers that option, so we should expect to see them with a low travel. This one has a bit deeper travel. Hmm. Big trackpad, I like it, except for it's a very slick surface. I find fine motor control a little bit hard there, but you're not using the trackpad when you're gaming. But the other star of the show here is the 4K mini LED display. 144 hertz of delicious, almost OLED-like goodness in terms of the fact that it has 1,000 local dimming zones. That means in white tiling on a black background, if you're looking for it, and I know you, watch, you folks watching this are the kind who will look for it, you might see a little blooming around that white text on a black background, but generally speaking, really black blacks like it measured OLED level with our color rimmer on this beautiful color saturation uh, the only drawback is MSI's true color software is never the best now we ran it at P3 because it's supposed to be a full P3 display among their presets sRGB gaming you know all those things like that and it didn't actually achieve quite full P3 but I kind of suspect their calibrations are to blame it also supports HDR, and you can turn on Windows HDR, and it actually, you know, Windows 11 HDR isn't that bad. Things don't go all out of whack and weird. If you're doing precise photo or video editing, you probably don't want to be in HDR mode, right? But for consuming content, it's just fine. But 
Wow. And it's HDR 1000, not the usual you see HDR 400, which ain't nothing really. That means it reaches 400 nits of brightness, which isn't very bright. HDR 1000 means you enable HDR mode and boy, the whites will bloom. Like you're playing Cyberpunk 2077 and you're coming out from under the ubiquitous overpasses and the bright sunlight is streaming in. Oh my God, it's like blinding just like real life. It's very enjoyable. It's very good. Colors are nice on it as well. Now, if you just run it in normal mode, non-HDR, it's still exceptionally bright, 630 nits. And MSI had a little bug and updating the BIOS helps some of them, but it still shows up. If you're switching between GPU modes or between HDR and normal mode, sometimes the brightness control didn't work and it was just maxed out. Let me tell you, if you're sitting in an indoor room, it's blindingly bright. So it's a selling point. It's 17.3 inch. It's not 18 inch, which is trendy, but you know, with an 18 inch display, what you're doing is gaining a little height because there's 16 by 10 aspect ratio, no more width. So similar footprint and viewport size. I would say when gaming, give me 4K mini LED and luscious colors and high contrast and all that sort of thing with games that are still typically designed first for 16 by nine aspect ratio and enjoying movies and stuff like that versus 18 inch if that gets me that resolution and this display quality, whereas the competitors are typically rolling with, you know, QHD, 2K IPS displays. Yeah. And we've got the horsepower here to game at 4K. So before 4K was there for the content creators, not so much for the gamers, but even with last generation, the higher end RTX, like 3080, you know, even 3070, you can play 2K games quite well, 2K resolution. Uh, but 4K was pushing it in some titles maybe. This one, everything I threw at it ran great. At 60 frames per second are better in 4K resolution. Cyberpunk being, if you're running it ultra, you know, ray tracing ultra, maxed out. That one I would still run at 2K if you really want to keep your frame rate 60 and above. But the frame rates on this are amazing. And again, where it was available as a feature to turn off, like in Cyberpunk, we turned off the DLSS3 frame interpolation just as a comparison point for the last generation. And if you do use DLSS3, and I would say do it. It's a feature. It's there. They added it. It makes for better frame rates and even smoother gameplay. It will be very important when you go for the lower end, like say uh, RTX 4060 or something like that. It can make a difference, but you don't even need that. 4K, Far Cry, and that's very CPU intensive. So Intel's performance here is quite good. Great at 4K. Cyberpunk, Ghost Recon, Breakpoint, all those more demanding games good stuff. Now thermals are well under control with this unit. Again, it's big. It has a big chassis. It had that big booty hanging out the rear and all those heat pipes. Um, CPU temperatures and GPU temperatures. Uh, GPUs are always artificially limited to make sure they don't fry themselves. But the CPU, I mean, never once did I see it hitting 95 or 100 degrees Celsius. Pretty much in games, we were in the 60s to the 70s uh, without thermal throttling either. It's not like performance went and then tanked. You keep it down. So it's well done. What about the noise levels? Now, I ran this in the extreme performance mode. So you're going to get the most performance and also the most noise. And you will hear the fans. They're not grating or hissy because, you know, it's a big unit with big it's fans. And it blew warm air, not hot air, at any given time playing games for hours, benchmarking. But you will hear the fans on this. And having been using a desktop lately for a change, which I usually don't do, it's even more noticeable. But uh, it's not worse than the other gaming laptop. But just because it's a big chassis don't mean it's going to be quiet. Of course, it's MSI. You can tune the fan profiles and all that sort of thing. It is running it pretty chillax all the time. Yeah. You do have four speakers, two woofers, two stereo speakers. They're pretty decent. They're pretty loud. Um, despite the woofers, I wouldn't mind a little bit more bass, but you know, gaming laptops don't always have the best speakers and these are pretty good. I would say Asus Rogue Strix machines have even better speakers, but yeah. But given the fan noise, if you're going to run in extreme mode and a 4K resolution like I was, you might be using headphones anyway. Ports on this, obviously it's a big machine. We don't even have to wonder about that. You got your Thunderbolt 4, you got a full size SD card slot, your mini display port, HDMI 2.1, USB A's, headphone jack, of course. So you're all set when it comes to the port. And gaming laptops, usually not much on biometrics, but it's starting to change. So we have both a fingerprint scanner on the keyboard deck and we have a Windows Hello facial IR recognition camera. Good to be in modern times, just because you're a gamer, it doesn't mean that you really want to have to type in your pin or your password every single time, right? But the webcam, hello 2023, 
why we have a 720p webcam. The same is true of the ASUS SCAR18 as well. They're not alone in this abysmal state of the world, right? Now that MP will video conference more, we all want to be at low resolution. Just imagine twitching at 720p. Okay, you're going to buy an external camera, aren't you? All right, let's take a look at the internals now. First off, the lid and the keyboard deck are aluminum on this. The bottom is still genuine plastic. It's nice to know that your $5,000 went somewhere, isn't it? Okay, lots of ventilation opening here. Fans vent out the sides and the rear as is normal for gaming laptops. And our speaker grills are over here. So 11 Phillips head screws, all the same size, yay that. And then some tenacious plastic clips. With MSI laptops, typically the first time you take it off is the hardest. Then the clips loosen up a little bit, it gets easier. Just work your way around, start from the side and well, you'll eventually get it off. You do not have to take off the top butt cover on this to get this off. So let's take that off. And here are the internals, and wow, there's a lot of heat pipes going on here. Happy day. And we have our CPU and GPU heat sinks over here. As you can see, four fans, two big ones, two small ones, very adequate cooling. And hey, if you want to repaste it, obviously not that hard to do. You don't have to, it's not an inverted motherboard or anything like that. So we have our 99.9 watt hour battery here, the largest you can actually put in a laptop and still be able to take it on an airplane legally. And I, you know, it's a giant gaming laptop. So putting this in integrated graphics mode or hybrid mode, I, I averaged about mm, three and three quarters hours on a charge. Not gaming, just doing productivity work and stuff like that. You know, gaming much shorter, but you won't want to do that because if you unplug this from power, it drops the display brightness from 600 plus nits to 400 and it also drops the CPU and the GPU power. Speaking of switchable graphics, this has switchable graphics. It has a MUX switch so you can go with dedicated all the time, integrated all the time, or switchable hybrid mode and it requires a reboot. It's not advanced Optimus. So here we have our socketed killer Wi-Fi 6E card, which is actually made by Intel. It is good stuff here and a little bit of tape coming up. Whoop. And right under here are four RAM slots, not two like you usually see on a gaming laptop. So they sell, sell this with either 64 or 128 gigs of RAM. It's DDR5, 4,800 megahertz. It could take 5,600 megahertz. Pretty hard to find. The only thing I've seen on the market so far are crucial 16 gig dims at that speed, so hey, that's okay. And for SSDs, we have four terabytes of storage, which is what you're gonna get with the more expensive model. The less expensive model is two terabytes, and uh, it's set up in RAID zero. I don't know if that was really the best idea for a gaming laptop, but it is. So we have PCIe 5 for boot, and then we have a pair, spare PCIe 4 slot available here. So good expandability, excellent serviceability, just what we would expect from a large MSI laptop. So, I'm not even going to do a should you buy this. This thing is 4000 plus to 5000 plus dollars, right? There's only a certain number of people that will ever buy this kind of laptop. And if you can afford it, you know who you are. And if you want the best of the best performance, yes, just go ahead. But for the rest of the normals out there, it bodes well, like I said, for the more affordable models. The $25, $2600 models are going to come out with a Core i9 and an RTX 4080. So I'm looking forward to that. We have some in-house. We even have an interesting 14-incher with a RTX 4050. So we're going to be testing the gamut of what these can do. So it's promised Thing. Also remember prices will come down, especially when NVIDIA realizes everybody doesn't want to get porked by them anymore, right? Mm -hmm. But that's the happy part. The sad part is right now when you're looking at this, or you're looking at Razer Blade 18 or even 16 with an RTX 4090, particularly those are the ones that are punishingly expensive right now. So hold out for the more affordable ones like us normals can afford. I'm Lisa from Mobile Tech Review. Be sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel for more cool tech videos and thumbs up if you like this vid.